Hey everybody, welcome back to the 14th episode of Open Source for Business, brought to you by Open Teams. My name is Henry Badry, and this is the podcast where you can learn from the world's top open source software experts about how to better manage the open source technologies that you use at your company. Today, I had a fun and engaging conversation with Patrick McFadden, who is the VP of Developer Relations at Datastax. Patrick is one of the leading experts of Apache Cassandra, which is an open source database management system. Some of the topics that Patrick and I discussed today that I found really interesting were the changing attitude towards open source from the 90s to today. Patrick gives a few examples of how open source has reset the economics of building software in the past, and he goes on to explain how Kubernetes is resetting the economics once again today. Another topic that I found interesting was the importance of site reliability engineers in the database world. This podcast is sponsored by Open Teams, the first market network where users of open source software can find, vet, and contract with service providers. Open Teams is your single source for everything open source. Now that you have a better idea of what's to come in this podcast, let's turn up the music. Great. Henry, it seems like we're in the same room. It's crazy. <laughs> it seems like we're in the same room. You've got a green screen. I've got a little bit of more of a white background. A little. I think this is waves. I haven't quite figured out this picture yet, but I think it's the ocean. It looks um, like waves. Um, if Yeah, if I had planned ahead i probably would have been running open broadcast studio and then i could have had real waves behind me but nope then not you could today. have uh, <laughs> then you would have got there <laughs> next time next podcast when you have we have you on again but yeah thank you so much for joining us patrick you originally uh, you spent a lot of your career in uh, education so can you take us through a bit about uh, that journey sure and actually that's how i got started with open source um I worked in in California in the California State University system um, in the early 1990s. Um, this is around 93, 94. We were starting um, to. And I was just some young idiot that was helping network everything that possible. But you know, this is when we were starting to bring internet connections to every single community college, every single university. We had a thing called C4Net, um, but in that world in 93, uh, we were also trying to figure out how to uh, get machines going. And, you know, like we, we had some choices, but they weren't very good because there was a lot of very expensive Unix systems out there. And that was my first real dip into open source software, which was Linux. Um, we were running a lot of our systems on like 0.8 kernel um, in 1993. And it was pretty wild west it was when i first learned how to be a kernel hacker because that's the only way you can make things work but i mean I, <laughs> I i worked at cal poly state university for quite a few years and i worked on some of the bigger projects there um and then eventually i i left i left the university because that's what you do but that was you know we were doing all open source work back then and what was the open source community back then? Was there a community or was it really just Linux and a group of hackers uh, that weren't really connected or part of this thing called open source? Yeah, no, there was definitely a community. I mean, there was a community that went way back. I mean, you're talking about like Free Software Foundation and uh, the GNU um, Emacs, I think was been had, you know, in, in the 1990s, had been around for at least 10 or 15 years. Um, but it was... I think it was really funny how it was much more of a fringe element for sure. Um, you know, I remember talking to somebody at the late nineties about using open source software. I was like, Oh, it's just a bunch of free software hippies that, you know, why, why would we use that software? But there was a pretty strong community. I mean, this is when we had, this is when Apache software foundation got started. And I remember talking to like a V email to Brian Bellendorf, who was one of the founders at ASF about, the Apache server, which was what everyone used for HDVD. And it was a small group of people, but it was funny how it grew really quickly. Like there was this core group of people that believed in open source software because it was the only way we were going to scale. And uh, that, you know, you look at what the choices were um, in the early days of the internet, there was a lot of proprietary software that was really expensive and kind of in difficult or impossible to work with. Um, so it really took a, a personal effort on your own and free software, free as in freedom, not free as in beer, to make mm -hmm. things work. And that's, that's how, I mean, and that was that community of users that we were. 
Right. And when did you start seeing the popularity of open source increase? Uh, when, when did that start to happen? Um, because I, I know you were just saying it was Linux. Is that really, what, what kind of other, maybe we'll start with what kind of other projects were around then that had this open source idea uh, around it? You know, it was, is interesting because I, I wound up leaving the university and getting all wrapped up in the stupid dot com thing, which was a lot of fun, but <laughs> um, yeah. it was also really dominated by proprietary software. And it was Sun, Oracle, BEA. I mean, there was those are the software stacks. IBM was involved, you know, WebSphere and things like that. Um, it was really after the dot com crash um, when we didn't have millions of dollars to throw around and uh, it, it turned into more of a ground ground effort. Like we're down here at the bottom level. We, we have nothing but hopes and dreams. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only one way to go. <laughs> and that that's really, I started, uh, I, so I started an open source consulting company um, to just do software builds and deployments with open source software in 2001, um, mm -hmm. mainly because there was hardly any contracts left. But um, it really started taking off. And that's when you saw like the LAMP stack come from, you know, like the, the Linux, MySQL, uh, PHP, um, the Apache web server. And, you know, then it, that's the, I think there was that resurgence of like what the dot-com craze should have been. And that's when like the Googles, the Facebooks, um, <laughs> MySpace, um, the companies that were actually doing things at scale were starting to really push forward quickly all the technology and open source. Were these companies using, uh, say, but for the dot-com crash, uh, you said that not a lot of companies were really using open source. What was the reasoning behind that? What was their attitude back then towards it? Oh, it was it was easy. I mean, it was a, just a perception of, well, if I didn't pay for it, there's no quality or it's insecure. Um, and, you know, especially things like operating systems, it's like, well, I, I paid Sun for this piece of software and I have a support contract. But then, yeah. you know, Red Hat, kind of killed that off and did a nice job with it. It's like, if you are an enterprise company, we have a, a plan. And that was what made Red Hat really, um, that was it turned them into a billion dollar company is that they, they gave people the option. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's some things like, do you think Google could have built Google if they were paying Sun and Oracle license fees for everything? Yeah, probably yeah, not. No, no. <laughs> yeah. And was the, when was the explosion of the open, uh, all of these open source projects? When did you really see it start becoming such a global phenomenon or was it like that in the beginning? Uh, was it when you're at Hobson's was it a lot bigger than say when you, uh, uh, when you were using Linux in the nineties? Yeah, we, we standardized all our, most of our stack. We had a, like, just like everyone in the early two thousands, we had a standard double stack. You know, we had Linux and we had Microsoft windows, <laughs> you know, windows yeah. server. And, um, but Linux ran most of what we needed to run. And, um, you know, that's, I think that was when things really turned because we went from, well, it's a lower quality to, yeah, this is the only way to get this done. And, uh, I, I, what was really fascinating to me is it was around, it was the validators were the Googles and the Facebooks because mm -hmm. they were building these massive scale companies off of open source software. And I, th I think that's really what blew it up. And, and then eventually cloud, I remember the first time I used Amazon in 2008, there was no proprietary software involved, none. It was all open source. And um, the cloud just <laughs> took a match and threw it on the gas. And it was like, there you go, boom. And that, and that made it really take off at that point. Cause we were depending, we were uh, deploying things at such a massive scale, you know, open source software is the only thing they were keeping up. Why, why did you see open source really explode? What do you think was driving that? So the, it's very interesting is open source has really done a, an amazing job of resetting the economics of every era in computing. Um, and the first big reset was in the 1990s when we, we reset the economics of an operating system. And what, what's fascinating is I, I tell people today about, yeah, an operating system? Oh yeah, I remember paying Sun like ten thousand dollars for SunOS to run on a Sun server, and yeah. uh, you paid for an operating system. <laughs> like yes, we paid a lot, and wow. it, it reset the economics. And then in the two thousands, it reset the economics on the application tier, um, and then it 
eventually it reset the economics and like infrastructure, full blown infrastructure with cloud, um, data, databases, um, middleware, all of that. Um, and it, the driver is, you know, is costs. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I keep saying that we've reset, keep resetting economics is because um, we can't, if there's a, if you're buying 10 things at a certain set price and it was priced because you're going to buy 10 of them, what if you need to buy a thousand of them? Well, the, the yeah. unit economics don't work anymore. And open source software moves so quickly and responds so well that it, it resets the economics so quickly that and I think that's a big part of it in my opinion is and now we're going to see it again kubernetes is doing it it's going to reset the economics one more time for cloud companies find that it's a lot cheaper and it works better these days but was it always that case do companies uh, i think companies now at least just what i've observed in the industry is they've realized that yes open source is free but you do have to pay for some things whether it's support or training or a lot of other services uh, to help that software work for you was that always the attitude of companies or did companies uh, previously did they think no hey this is free why should i pay for it what what, what did that look like and how did that change yeah there's <laughs> there was a lot of uh, delusional thinking back in the day it's like well i just download it and use it right yeah, well, okay, sure. But the leading indicator of that delusion, delusional stuff was how big engineering teams are growing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because uh, it's like, well, we have a team of people that will help support it internally. So you are paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, we have a team of engineers. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, but it was, I think there was, you know, Red Hat, like I said, you know, that was the first, you know, big open source company. And a lot of people yeah. say it was the only company that could have ever done that. But um, what what I think it was a shift and a really good shift somewhere along the line is that somebody finally said, you know what, open source means that this is a, there's an, a contribution aspect to this. And Sometimes you like I, full disclosure. I work at a database company, an open source database company. Um, people pay us to support and run Apache Cassandra. I'm perfectly happy if you want to go use Apache Cassandra open source. I mean, you have to live in that dual world. But one of the things that I, I think has really made um, open source successful as an adoption play is where there's a bit of ownership at some of these large companies. Um, you know, Facebook, Google, Netflix are all strong contributors to open source. You know, they have committers and open source projects. And it's just an understanding. You know, like I, I have uh, friends at Netflix who, you know, that, that's their job is they contribute to open source. But it, it does affect and it's because they want to have a hand in what's going on with this project. Um, so things have shifted, you know, how you pay for things. Now you have a choice. You have a lot of choices. You can pay a, a supplier or you can buy some engineering time. <laughs> so you spent quite a bit of time at Hobson's uh, and then you moved on to data stack. So can you talk about that evolution? What led you to move? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was out of education. Company. Yeah. You got off the education. shackles and you, <laughs> you ran free. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. No, <laughs> I'll get pulled back again. Um, maybe not this time. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but yeah, what it was was that I was the story I like to tell people is I is I you know as a chief architect there I was responsible for a lot of the decisions around technology and um, I was deplatforming Oracle as fast as possible because I was just sick and tired of paying the for what I didn't feel like had any value anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but what some of the things that and this is and this is in 2010 2011 is we were changing the type of scale problems we were having. Then um, that was about the time that a lot of NoSQL databases became a glimmer in some developer's eye, you know, open source projects popping up all over the place. <clears throat> and it's funny because I, I think, man, <laughs> I want to go back to that era again and try to take notes about like all the open source databases that came out during that time. Cause I think a lot of them got lost in time, but there was yeah. a lot. And, what I what I was looking at is like I I have a scale problem that is unique, but it wasn't. Um, and then there was this database, Apache Cassandra. Um, I just I I landed on it for what it did, but then as I got to know it more and I started actually working with it, contributing to it, <clears throat> it was clear. I was like, 
this is a legitimate database. And um, I think this is the future. And that was where I saw it. It's like, okay, we're making a transition point. I saw the cut point. And so we're going from proprietary databases or very kind of an old school version of a relational database and into this whole nother era of scale databases, distributed systems, cloud. And as I'm working on it, working on it, I became more involved in the community. And then eventually one of the co-founders who I knew at, at a company called Riptano, um, he's like, man, why don't you, do you want to just do this all the time? And he kept asking me and asking me, I'm like, oh man, I don't know. Hell right? yeah. <laughs> and then finally I'm like, sure, I'll do it. And then they changed the name to the company to data stacks <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> like right about that time. And I'm like, oh man. But, um, yeah, Riptano to data stacks. It was the thing that really appealed to me was like, I feel like this is a really cool next gen for me is now I'm going to be really involved in a project that I believe in. And I really feel like this is a database my kids would use. Yeah, that's what made, gave me that. It was my background with open source and infrastructure that kind of led to that. That was the, all the paths that led to this one point. And I've been here for eight years now. <laughs> Yeah, wow. I guess it's stuck. And, yeah, now you're now you've got shackles on again, and you're stuck in the database world. That's right. <laughs> you're not going to leave. Uh, so, mm. did you have GitHub back then? Are you, you you were using GitHub, so you had at least you could uh, you could PR or you, you could use it to have a pull request. <laughs> well, one thing that I, I can't really grasp is how did open source work before that? What did you do? Because it all yeah. seems quite simple now, working <laughs> together on the internet, but it wasn't always that easy, was it? <laughs> oh henry you're making me feel old man like, <laughs> tell us how it was in the good old days yeah i was like well we had pieces of paper and we gave it to a you know we gave it to a horse and he wrote Stone it over chisel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just chipped it in <laughs> we had messengers so sometimes they'd get killed and you'd lose your commit <laughs> no no it wasn't that bad um it was uh, well so with the apache projects it's funny because it was just not too long ago maybe five years ago that we switched over to get mm -hmm. um before that, it was SCP, um, which or SVN, sorry, <laughs> uh, which was a better version of uh, CS, or CVS, which was a concurrent versioning system. So there were there were source control systems in use, but it wasn't Git. Git was actually it's really funny because I I saw the the lecture that Linus Torvalds gave. Did you know Linus Torvalds invented Git? Yes, I did. Yeah, I was doing, yeah. I, I used to post uh, quite a few photos of, say, famous people in open source or well-known people in open source. And I, I was surprised when I saw that. I didn't know. That was his, that was what he did originally before, didn't he? That was the first thing he did. Yeah. No, it wasn't actually. It was oh, something, it, it was a, it was a labor of, of anger. Um, you know, I was working on the, you know, he, as someone who's working quite heavily on the Linux project. And of course, because he's the guy, um, he was just, he was over using CVS um, and CVS was, was a really difficult system to work with if you had a lot of changes and merges and things like that. So he just said, ah, and, you know, went into his little cave and came out and says, I have Git. And in Linus's style, he, his first, you know, I saw this, it was a, a lecture or a presentation he did at Google that was record and you can probably still find it on youtube but basically he was saying cvs is like brain dead stupid it's dumb why would anyone ever use it it's a piece of trash i mean he was just so linus and then he explained git but you know in classic linus fashion he was completely right and man everyone just moved over um svn was used a lot at apache software foundation um you know that then eventually moved over to get but we did have versioning systems it just mm -hmm. weren't as nice <laughs> what are some best practices for say uh, anyone working in an enterprise that uses open source uh, and and they're working with open source communities what are some best practices for working with those communities yeah and, and that goes right in line with what i do a lot of in I do work with a lot of companies that you know they have clear goals economic goals they, you know they have a business to run and they're not just software companies um but I think that uh, that was a that was an adage from um, oh who said that it was like every software every company is a software company and it's true I mean that's, that's part of how we do things the best practice of, of like how does a company like an enterprise work with open source it comes down to participation you know don't don't be you know if you're 
if you're a casual user and you're not really participating, that's fine. I mean, we, we love our users, but you have to embody this feeling of, of sharing and interaction if you want to get the most out of it. And it, it, it sometimes, and it, it's, this has changed a lot over the past few years. I remember like in 2012, even 14, 15, it was so hard to get an enterprise user to get past PR and everything to talk about what they were like, something stupid, like how I installed Cassandra using VMware, you know? And they're like, well, you can't talk about that. Why? <laughs> and uh, companies like Netflix, you know, they completely blew it down. I mean, they have Netflix open source. Like if you look at their GitHub, you'd think, wow, I could totally build, I could build Netflix myself just based on doing a bunch of Git pulls. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> There's a yeah. little more to it, but you know, they're very open about what they do. It, more companies are starting to do that. I think of like Capital One, which is a huge financial services company. Um, ING, a huge bank, both have these really cool open source program management stuff where they participate. You know, mm -hmm. they get involved and you think, wow, a bank is talking about how they do things. Yeah, they are. Um, and so that means getting on the mailing list. That means, you know, filing JIRAs if you run into a problem, um, maybe doing a presentation, uh, just little things that, you know, a blog post about something. These are things that help our communities all be a little bit better. And it, what it does also is it creates an interaction pattern with the rest of the community. So when you have trouble, you now have friends and you can go back and forth. And that's the best time when I see that. Like, oh, this thing broke. Oh, I know what to do. And they fix it. And there are two companies that are probably rivals, but they're on mm -hmm. ASF Slack and they're working it out together. It's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. You've got that collaboration between companies, but also companies now working with the open source communities. Now, I know that one of the reasons it seems that companies are doing that is because if you're seen as an open source friendly company, then good developers and great developers and also open source contributors, which are obviously in very high demand, they see that as such an amazing thing. And so they want to work for those companies. Uh, I found that also uh, a lot of uh, those developers, it's great for retaining talent because if you're allowed and you're paid to work on open source projects, then developers love that. What are some of the other reasons uh, other than say retaining talent and attracting great talent that companies are now getting more involved with the communities? Well, I think it's partly what I just mentioned is, is if you become an island, then you eventually there's consequences to that. It's, it's just not, it's like taking one little part of what open source can do for you and ignoring a good portion of it. That is great. Um, you're right. But why would you, so like, why would you attract these really great engineers? Because they think it's really cool and interesting software to work on. If, if a company doesn't interact with the, the world around them in open source, then, you know, it, I think it's just a time bomb that's ticking. You might, you might as well just go use proprietary software. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And I know one, one project that we talked about uh, in the pre-call that we had was Kate Sandra. Can you talk a bit about that? <laughs> yeah, that's my new thing. <laughs> my new shiny toy. Um, <laughs> Kate Sandra is a project uh, that we started. Uh, we started DataStax, but it's just growing into other companies as well. It's a, uh, it's a project, and this is this is what I really love about this. It's not just a bunch of bits. It's a project for running Cassandra on Kubernetes, and the mo most of what is it's about is the sharing of knowledge. You know, it's this knowledge as code, uh, that knowledge as code instead of knowledge as, as code as infrastructure. You know, code as infrastructure. We went there, but this is knowledge as code, and so. As, as we're learning how to run a complex distributed system on a complex distributed system, um, we will learn things. And there should be as many opportunities for us to share that information as possible. Um, you know, it's because it's, this is, we're all in this together eventually. And I, that's, that's really the focus of what Keith Sanders is about. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there are, is development work that needs to be done. I mean, we're building uh, Kubernetes operators that work well. Um, we have connectors that connect uh, parts of like K Kubernetes, uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem, such as Prometheus and FluentD with Cassandra. But it's also, you know, like we're going to be have. I, I run a, a biweekly SIG um, for, for this. And it's always going to be like, 
hey, I'm trying to get my storage system and I have this going on in this cloud and I don't get it to work right. Oh, mm -hmm. well, here's how you do that. And, and then it turns into a PR. Like, hey, we can codify that. Like if you were using you know, EBS, GP2, and you use these configurations, this is the way it should, this is the best practice for making it work. Mm -hmm. that, that carries that knowledge forward. And I, I, that's what's most exciting for me. 2021, you know, for Kate Sandra is gonna be like building out this massive knowledge base in a Helm chart. Helm install, good to go. And is uh, Datastax monetizing that project? No, it's, no. Uh, okay. it's an open source. Well, what it is, is actually, it's really interesting is we, um, we have our cloud product, which mm -hmm. is a, a, is Cassandra as a service, but it runs on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So the benefit we get by sharing is that we're, we're sharing all the information we know about Kubernetes running, running Cassandra and Kubernetes, but the, we want to, you know, we're exchanging information. Other people are like, oh, we're learning things from other people. So it, there's a benefit for, a, you know, we're we're embracing the open sourceness of this. Is like, if we don't get all walled garden and just kind of huddle and that, no, this is our information, not yours. If we're very giving about the information, we will get it back. We'll get new things back. And we have, we've gotten a lot of really cool stuff that we've put in production on our cloud. Mm -hmm. Um which means someone, some other cloud provider could use that information as well. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, we, how we monetize it eventually is that it's just, we have a better system for, for us to sell in our cloud product. And what are some of the challenges that Kate Sanders has been facing or that you've been working on? Uh, boy, right now it's, uh, <laughs> Kubernetes. <laughs> Kubernetes <laughs> is, was built around the idea of running, uh, stateless systems and, stateless systems such as a web server, uh, microservices, that sort of thing. And um, running a database on Kubernetes is a fairly new concept. It's because those are stateful services. They require deeper uh, integration with storage and different concepts with networking. Um, so th the biggest challenge that we have right now, I think, is just getting, um, getting that aligned properly so that whenever you deploy it, that you're getting like a real common problem with running Cassandra and Kubernetes is you get the default storage provisioned and sometimes it's not what you need because it's a database that needs to have fast storage and it needs to have performance. Uh, let's just get into performance, like low latency storage. Um, if you're connecting to an NFS share with, you know, epic 50 millisecond latencies, then you're not going to have a successful database implementation, but you could easily tr fall into that trap. Um, yeah. because whenever you ask for a persistent volume, Kubernetes is like, oh, here's one, try this. <laughs> uh, and these are the, these are lessons that we have already been learned. Um, and we're, we're getting better at how to de be declarative about making sure you have the right. We're working with other projects like open EBS to make sure mm -hmm. that we have a better setup. And this is a really cool thing too, about Kate Sanders. It's, you know, it's, we get it, not, it's just not Cassandra. There's other projects that are going to be involved in, you know, to solve some of these bigger problems. And where do you see, what's your say five or 10 year vision for Kate Sandra? Where, where do you see it going? Uh, well, my, my very publicly stated goal is to make uh, Cassandra the default data uh, database for Kubernetes. But eventually what I, what I feel like is going to happen is that um, with Kubernetes, because Kubernetes in the way that it's been what the goals for that project are, which I, I think is great, is really, I don't want any developer to ever really think about a database ever again. I think that, that those days are coming to an end. We should be talking about data services. And when you deploy uh, your application, you connect to data services without thinking about what the underlying database is. And mm -hmm. uh, we have another open source project called Stargate which is a really cool name. It's, it's main purpose is that creating um, API gateways for data services. It's now included in Kate Sander if you want to deploy it. Within 10 years, I think that, you know, a developer should be able to develop an application in a day or two mm -hmm. that scales as much as you possibly want um, at an economical and a very economically in the cloud yeah. and not have to worry about it. Where do you see open source heading? 
say, let's 10 years down the track or even further? Without a doubt, we're, we're going to see more conflict between what cloud can do and what open source is. But it, it feels like what I, from where I'm sitting now that there's a lot of we're solving some of the initial problems we have with open source versus the cloud. Like this is what data, data stacks. I mean, like I say, uh, I think we solved a problem here. Is like our cloud product is also an open source product. Mm -hmm. So you know, we there's the economics work both ways, and we hope that you'll rent it from us. But if not, just go ahead and download it. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Um, eventually, though, I think, and this is where I think a lot of the future is going to be dependent on is how many people even want to download anything. And if you're not interested in downloading anything, then you're just going to rent it from somebody. Um, I suspect that that's, that will still be very heavily dominated by open source. And it will be a matter of sharing between some of the largest companies in the world in a really funny way. Like Apache Cassandra is, you know, if you're using it every single day, because it's used, it's dominated Apple and Netflix, Huawei. Um, it's used uh, on um, NTT Docomo. So, when, so any phone you probably are using right now, is, mm -hmm. is connecting to Cassandra. But mm -hmm. all those companies have people working on it, and that's that core infrastructure. Um, I think that's still going to be the case for a long time, is we're going to see these really funny collaborations between companies that you never thought would collaborate, but they're going to do it. <laughs> One thing we did discuss in the pre-call was SRE. So first of all, what are SREs, and where do you what role do you see them playing in the future? Well, let's take it from what probably is more established in people's minds is the DBA, um, database administrator. And DBAs traditionally have been the ones that have been responsible from beginning to end on a database de deployment, um, mm -hmm. from installing it, running it, maintaining it, even talking to developers about how to use it properly. Um, they're they're the, the knowledgeable Oracle of source for all database stuff. Um, that role is starting to get somewhat subverted by just the bigness of what we're trying to accomplish with infrastructure. And so you mentioned SREs, also not new, site reliability engineer, but mm -hmm. it was a term that was coined at Google and uh, there's a great book about it. And it, it, it started out pretty slow, but now it's really picking up steam. It's, and it, the reason being is because it's embodying something that's really important. It's not about the what you install, it's how you install it. Mm -hmm. And how, what does it mean to the business? So SREs are much more involved in the cost economics of, hey, if I'm, and so they, they're balancing this experience for the end user and what it, the bottom line for the company, and they're balancing mm -hmm. those things really well. We're trying to. So, you know, when you're using a mobile application and um, you want the best experience, they're going to make sure that, they're deploying the right infrastructure to make sure anybody in the world gets a great experience. Um, yeah. And DBAs, I, I really, I'm on a mission here. I want to see DBAs up level themselves to SREs because they already have a lot of the re requisite knowledge. They just need to add a little bit more. But, you know, SREs are going to be the, the torch bearer for open source infrastructure deployments for a lot okay. of reasons. I wanted to shift gears a bit, and I know that throughout uh, last year, you and I met a few times, and we talked a lot about the pandemic and everything that was happening. How do you think 2020 and the pandemic that uh, really has continued to now affect business or impact business? Oh boy, it's accelerated so many things, and you know, it's it, it doesn't go without stating the pan. There's nothing good about this pandemic. Nothing. It's caused a lot of problems, and you know, there's. We will be studying this for a lot of time, a long time, 20 years from mm -hmm. now. We're still talking about the pandemic from 1918. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's nothing good about it. Um, but one of, the, I, one of the things we talked about as a result is that it really accelerated a lot of digital transformation. And in, in a lot of weird ways, too. Um, I think I shared the story with you. It was like, the, like a local slushy shop, you know. As soon as we had started having lockdowns, they went online and they were, I mean, you could order a slushy and they deliver it to your house. And, you know, that was amazing. They've, they turned on a dime and I don't know what service they're using, like Stripe or something like that, but they, 
they figured it out. It's like, okay, this is the way we're going to do this. And um, I, I think that that genie's out of the bottle. Um, yeah. And the, the companies that just never really got there are going to disappear already. I mean, we've already had a record amount of bankruptcies this year or mm-hmm. 2020, and we'll see more in 2021. Because if you didn't go there, then you're not, you're not going to make it. And, and it's big and small. Um, you know, I, um, like I, I was, I think I told you the story about Home Depot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is one of my favorite stories because it's like, as they're look, you know, Home Depot is a pretty amazing technology company. Um, <laughs> I, I work a lot with those teams. Um, and they use a lot of Cassandra to power that. And uh, like when you go into a Home Depot, um, you know, big home warehouse, home improvement warehouse, and you're looking for a screwdriver or something, um, they have an app on your phone that will tell you where exactly it is in the store. It's really cool. Unlike, unlike Ikea where you spend <laughs> No, they put time. you through a maze on purpose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and at the end, you get a meatball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they took that that... You know, they already had a pretty decent technology platform. And whenever the pandemic happened, they're like, we we can't have in-store traffic. So we're going to do curbside pickup. Within weeks, they had flipped everything into this this project and they were do- doing home uh, curbside pickup. And, it, you know, that that's a good example of how digital transformation and, and they were just confident in their ability to do deployments within a few, like within a few sprints. And they had something that was, and because of that, the valuation of the company went up during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Target is yeah. another company in the U.S. that did that. Um, yeah. So these are, I think, these are the stories we're going to tell, which are going to be like, well, that's what changed. Yeah. And what role has open source played in all of that? Oh, their entire stack is open source. Yeah. I mean, they're using Cassandra for a lot of things. They're using um, uh, a lot of Spring. I know that at Home Depot, they use a lot of that, but, um, you know, their teams are really, they're really oriented around open source. You know, they do a lot of talks. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Sean Dirty um, was a Cassandra MVP. So he's really, I just saw him on the mailing list the other day. He's one of the chief architects there at Home Depot. So, I mean, they're really involved in open source and, you know, shout out to Sean. Yeah, I love that guy. He, he he's uh you know he's got a day job but he spends time interacting with the you know with community and, and answering questions on a mailing list and then taking a step back even further from that what role do you think open source has played uh in this digital transformation that has happened in 2020 during the pandemic oh man no or di- digital acceleration might you call it <laughs> yeah digital acceleration it's a big deal is is just it's shortened sales cycle without having to get into a sales cycle like i could you imagine you know like getting into a big long contract conversation with somebody like ibm or somebody like that um and six months later you finally get an agreement (laughs) it's like or 18 months which is pretty typical for a large enterprise deal um so it just made it easy for someone to just take something and you know pluck it out of github give it a try you know, weekend hack project, it it gave so much freedom to everyone to try a little something new mm-hmm. without having to, you know, without that cost, but also the understanding that this is this open source software, I can, I can understand it. I can look at it. I can pick it apart. There's a community that will support me. Um, it, I think it just really accelerated a lot of that without putting a lot of these weird barriers in front of us. And I know you're a very optimistic person. That's what I've figured out uh, since I have, have got to know you quite well. So I just want to wrap this podcast up with a question. One of my favorite questions. What are you most excited about with regards to the future of open source software? Oh, I can't wait to see what happens when we start emerging from this planet and the interstellar needs of data and uh, software. Like what's going to happen there? I mean, we already start. We've already started seeing like open source software in satellite, but I, you know, this whole space race is really fascinating. Like, I hope open source has a place there because yeah. it just is one. Of, it's like the next big, really interesting, crazy thing that humans will do, and I hope it has a big place there. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Patrick. I really do appreciate it. It's been great chatting with you. Yeah, thanks, Henry. I really appreciate it. 
And for everyone listening, uh, thank you so much for listening and thanks for tuning in again. If you like what you listened to today or if you're watching this on YouTube, then please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or leave a comment on our YouTube channel uh, letting us know what you think. So thanks very much, everyone. Stay safe. And until next time, see you later.